Barney, you have had a remarkable career, beginning as a psychiatrist, understanding about uh, human mental activities and mental problems, and then becoming one of the world's great uh, neuroanatomists uh, for the brain to be um, being able to understand the microstructure. Reflecting on your entire career, how do you look at the concept of consciousness? As a neuroscientist, as a neuroanatomist, consciousness, what does it mean to you? Yes. Well, Robert, to me, consciousness is an indivisible part of complex nervous systems in action. The first inference then would be that consciousness is not limited to humans. It is part and parcel of the big brain experience. My own feeling is that consciousness is a, it's not a recent acquisition, but the richness that we associate with consciousness is pretty well related to the overgrowth of that thing we call the cerebral hemisphere to <laughs> large brains. So my hunch is that with smaller hemispheres, which all of the forms have, you have consciousness, but probably less image-filled, less vivid, less, from our point of view, interesting. I also view consciousness as a continuum of nodes. And what do I mean by a node? A specific, what shall we say, input-output experience in time. Let me give you an example. We were out in the Serengeti a few years ago, watching the animals graze. The grazing experience seems to be highly automatic. If a predator comes into their view, immediately the patterns change. The heads lift, the ears go up, they orient. If the predator seems to be coming close, they take appropriate action. <clears throat> My hunch is that what we call consciousness exists at probably a very low, maybe even a non-significant level in the grazing beast. But when there is an input that disturbs a part of the brain that we call the core or the reticular core, which is sensitive to change and only to change, then this thing called consciousness opens out, which allows the animal then to examine options and to select an option. So, in terms of what you say, <clears throat> what, what of your questions you asked, to me, consciousness is an inalienable, an inalienable part of the large brain in action, but that it represents many, many levels of activity. And right now, as you and I talk, and as we formulate questions and answers, we have a continuous, you might say, a continuous node of consciousness, which in part connects us, and in part motivates what we're doing. Because we're both focused. We're both focused. We're both, in a sense, trying to predict. We're both formulating. And that's very hard work for the, for the, cerebral, uh, okay. the cerebral cortex. Uh, so in answer to your question then, I think of consciousness as part of the brain at work, but it works at many different levels and under certain conditions, even for highly organized animals, I think consciousness can sink to a low level, which allows just basic, almost reflexive activities, sensory motor components, to do their thing, as long as selection amongst options is not necessary. When that rises to the fore, then consciousness seems to be a very much more important part of the experience. Now, I'm not grazing in the Serengeti, but I'm here in your teaching lab. And as I'm beginning to notice and think about consciousness, I notice that there's a lot of things in this lab. There are benches, computers, and teach. But I, until I said this, I was totally unaware of that, even though I was seeing all of that. I was focusing on your, on you and what your words were. And, and that was the only thing in my, consciousness, even though I, I was able to see everything else. And there's, there's good reason for that. There's a part of the brain <clears throat> called the thalamus. And the thalamus is, in a sense, the, the gateway to heaven. Everything going to the court. Where's the thalamus? We can point the thalamus out to you. The thalamus is up here, 
at the front end of the brain stem, which is the upward continuation of the, spi of the spinal cord. Okay. With possibly one exception, every kind of information headed for cortex has to first relay in the thalamus, and we don't understand what's happening there. It's a very complex kind of thing. From the thalamus, then the projections go up to cortex. But to go to the cortex, they've got to go through a, up to a very important toll booth. Oh. And we call that toll booth the nucleus reticularis thalami. And this system has the capacity to open or shut myriads of little gates or gatelets. And these gatelets, in general, tend to be cl sh uh, shut, closed, unless it is a high priority kind of information going through. As you and I concentrate on the questions and answers at hand, most of our other gatelets are closed. If I suggest to you that the light is rather strong coming over your left shoulder, mm. those gatelets automatically <laughs> open and you become aware of that. So there are structural substrates for this kind of selective consciousness you're talking about. And another ex simple example is when we put on our clothes, we, we feel, we feel, we put on our socks, of course. but as soon as we do, the rest of the day, I, I, I don't feel anything. No. And that's a mercy, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> or else we'd yeah. be, be, be d d d absolutely overwhelmed with sensory input. We, it would be, a, it would be like a colossal noise. And this is precisely what the nervous system is really, is really organized to do, which is to exclude all that is safely excludable. <laughs> so what we concentrate on has to be pertinent focused and of immediate need. Yes, yes. What about multitasking? We hear about that so often in today's world. Is, can a consciousness be able to literally focus on a number of things at the same time, or is that a, a mental illusion? Everybody differs, of course, in that capability. But no, it's probably not a mental illusion. We can train ourselves. As a matter of fact, we train ourselves in the other direction. Uh, the yoga learns how to lie on a bed of nails mm. with very little pain and after a while with not no even even no 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 lesions on his skin and we know that the prefrontal cortex the part up ahead which is the executive part right, right has some selective connections back to this nucleus reticularis thalami mm. if we think of this as in a sense the the apex of voluntary activity we can, through its use, and through rather simple techniques we call biofeedback or autohypnosis, we can learn how to selectively open or close some of these gatelets. So with training, one can see why, how it's possible to multitask, or on the other hand, to cut something completely out. For many years I had migraine headaches. I learned, I'm not sure what I did, but I learned how to close off the migraine pain for periods of 20, 30, 40 seconds at a time. Hmm. Simply, again, through manipulation of this system and its projection back to this wonderful little nucleus reticularis thalami. We have the impression that I'm making a decision, I'm deciding to do something, but we know there's no I, or is there an I? How, how do you, how do we take the, the common perception of of, of, of me as an individual and make it make sense in terms of what we know in, in the brain. Yes. In, this, in the sequence of decision-making <clears throat> process. It's funny, when you first asked that, I was about to say, well, the I is an artificial construct. Thinking ontogenetically, that is to say, thinking of the way the infant develops, we're almost sure, and most of the psychologists and the great psychiatrists of the past have taught us that the individual experiences of the infant are that of a kind of cosmic identification. The infant does not know the difference between his or herself and the breast, <laughs> the world, the mother's face, and so forth. And part of the great challenge of the first six months of your year is the progressive individuation of the individual. In that process, we're using many parts of the associative cortices as they come online, because initially they're not even operative yet. I think that the process of individuation represents the development of I-ness. And incidentally, 
under certain conditions of great deprivation, that individuation can break down as the cortices dehydrate and so forth. And it's under those conditions, probably, that we get these transcendental experiences that have been the source of three or four of the great religions <laughs> while we're at it. Yeah. Well, many of those people in those traditions uh, can train themselves to have these yes, types absolutely. of transcendent experiences in which they're eliminating this barrier between me and the rest of the universe. Yes, yes. But do you see a, um, a, a, a brain substrate for, for that to, to be able to make the, 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 the clean distinction yeah. uh, between yeah. the, the boundary? Boundaries are important in, in, in our brains, deciding between edges and where I end and where something else begins. I see that, I may be wrong, but I see that as a highly panoramic experience that utilizes very widely the parts of the brain. Certainly the highest level associative parts too, but the, the fact that I have a sense of self includes my feeling about what I probably look like to others. Mm. I know the way things feel to me, so that there are a myriad aspects, a myriad prisms that represent I. Mm. And this is so complex that it has to take up much of the brain. I, I'm not one who mm. points to a certain area and say, that's where I exist. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's everything. It's, it's, every, it's yeah. the big brain experience. It's the big brain experience. We do know one thing. We know that in most people, on the right side of the hemisphere, the right hemisphere, yeah. in this parietal region here, we have a sense of sidedness. There are two parts of our body, left and right, in a sense. And with destruction in this area, on the right hemisphere, the individual actually loses knowledge of the left side of the world, and more importantly, of the left side of his or her body. Wow. And such patients, as you know, won't dress that side of the body, and they'll often try to throw that part of the body out of the bed. They'll think somebody else's body is in there. So here is one component of Inus that can be localized in a large associative area, prior That's lobe. That's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, it's, and to hold hold that in your hand and to see the the piece of consciousness that that represents. Yes, it's a humbling experience, Robert. 